when we first did our research, um, our focus was on the significance of domestic violence for women's health with a specific focus on injury. Because that's what we believed at the time was the most um, dramatic presentation and therefore the most significant to women. Even though women were already telling us in the late 70s when we did this research and the early 1980s, violence wasn't the worst part. Over the years, we've been able to uh, amend the understanding of partner abuse that limited it to violence. And we've talked a little bit about the extent to which it involved coercive control. And we rejected the violence model uh, in part because we heard from women themselves about the range of uh, harms that they were experiencing, went way beyond violence, the range of tactics and so forth. We also got rid of the violence model because it completely failed us as a guide to intervention. Uh, and this was because we learned that the expectation uh, with respect to violence, that we could assess the seriousness of abuse by the level of injury that it inflicted, uh, completely masked the realities of women's lives were that, were, which were that while there were acts of significant injurious violence, these were mere punctuations in a lengthy history of physical and sexual abuse, most of which fell below the radar that was set by police or emergency rooms or social workers or others to identify abuse because they didn't cause injury. Nevertheless, the cumulative effects were devastating. Part of our focus on violence early on helped us to understand that domestic violence was the leading context in which children were abused. Our research way back was the first, I think, to show the concurrence of domestic violence and child abuse. We found in 45% of the cases of child abuse, the mother was battered and the primary uh, offender, uh, hurting both the mother and the child, was the male partner. At the time, everybody thought, uh, all the research was focused on mothers as the primary, uh, primarily responsible for abuse. There was no official recognition of domestic violence. All of it was attributed to behavioral problems, alcohol, mental health, poverty, or a woman's uh, cognitive deficits. You know, she was slow and what have you. So this was revolutionary. And so for three decades, uh, we focused on the effects of violence on children, primarily looking at exposure and witnessing, as well as direct physical abuse. We also looked at the effects of domestic violence on parenting, how the batterer interfered with the parenting in terms of discipline practices, how children were affected indirectly when the mother took to alcohol or drugs to mediate the abuse that she was experiencing to modify the stress. Then, lo and behold, as we've already, uh, as we've already mentioned, uh, we recognized that the, not only was the violence model, the model which uh, identified partner abuse with individual assaults inadequate and, and, and had to be replaced by the much more, I think, accurate picture of most abuse that women experience as coercive control, but we also had to rethink the idea that it was exposure to violence and the resultant trauma, either because of direct violence against the child or witnessing a primary parent hurt, that explained the negative outcomes for children. And so, as I began to interview children and began to look at the research of Emma Katz and others, uh, which was based on my work, but way, way, went way beyond it by looking at the qualitative effects of coercive control on children, it really became clear to me first that children were being coercively controlled as well as women. The same tactical patterns were being used with children. In other words, when we looked at the pattern of child abuse of children, it wasn't what was anticipated by Child Protective Services, the injury that a visiting nurse could detect or that would be reported by uh, a neighbor or a parent. The vast majority of the physical abuse of children, which was frequent, by the way, in abusive homes by the abuser, were low-level assaults, just as they were for women. And the same thing was true for sexual assaults. That is, there was sexual assault of children, some of it dramatic, but again, 
most of it fell on a continuum of sexual coercion, touching, inappropriate, uh, you know, dressing, um, depending on the age of the child. Uh, boys, by the way, as well as girls, but primarily female uh, children, were beginning to experience a range of sexual abuse, along with the violence, very much in the same ways that women were. When it came to isolation, intimidation, and some of the other elements, it was much more difficult to document this. But it, through my interviews, and, and, and now with some researchers look, like Emma Katz looking at particularly isolation, we're beginning to see that children are experiencing the same patterns of isolation, intimidation, and control. And moreover, many of the effects that we attributed to violence up to now are actually due to other elements of the abuse. And because we were only looking, because our violence model told us to look in that way, at certain kinds of outcomes, particularly those associated with trauma, we missed a whole set of outcomes. A good example would be the fact that when rigid gender roles are imposed upon children, boys and girls in a home, the same rigidity that the partner is imposing uh, on his wife or girlfriend at home are imposed on children, the children's school performance suffers dramatically because they can't, they lack the flexibility to adopt to the requirements of complex social relationships and education, you see? So that's just an example. Not only did the coercive control of children appear to replicate, in many ways, the coercive control of their mother, but there was an additional pattern, which one of my clients called, and I use the term, I don't particularly like it, but I don't have a better one, weaponization. batterers would weaponize children. They would use them as spies. They would use them um, uh, sometimes as co-abusers where there are older children. They would use them as pawns in court processes as ways of extending their abuse, particularly after a separation occurred. But not only, even in the household. I've had many, many instances uh, of that. So that was the second piece, that there was this coercive control of children that was symmetrical with the coercive control of the adult. But the other piece that I think is absolutely critical, is that when the abuse of the children occurred, and in the, particularly in the cases that I was working on as a forensic social worker, it was absolutely intimately tied to the course of control in the mother. In other words, the children were being harmed, not independently of the mother, but in direct ways designed to hurt her. In other words, in one of my cases, the guy was, a woman was a very successful uh, businesswoman. And so uh, he was very hesitant to uh, give any physical marks that would indicate abuse at work, but he would hurt the children. Again, the harm to the children were, was directly related to his control over the mother. Uh, sexual abuse committed against the daughter who was supporting the mother in order to drive her out of the house, further isolating her. Um, and, and I could give numerous examples of how children's abuse was directly linked or indirectly linked, instrumentally, and in the eyes of the abusive partner as a way of harming, threatening, intimidating, controlling the mother. And it creates what I call uh, the battered mother's dilemma. The battered mother's dilemma is created when a woman has to repeatedly choose between her own safety and well-being and her child's well-being, right? Uh, if you don't discipline the child, I will hurt the child more. So one of my clients puts her son's hand on the stove. Terrible, horrible thing. But both the son, when I interviewed him, and the mother know that if she had not done that, her partner would have done far worse. So, so, so what we're looking at then is the course of control of children as secondary not in secondary and importance in the sense that children are hurt, but secondary in the sense that the aim of harming the children is to dominate and control the mother. So what that told me is that there's a continuum of coercive control. That is that the coercive control of the children, the coercive control of the mother are part of a single strategic process. And that process, therefore, has to be treated as a single strategy. It has to be recognized as such and it has to be, interventions have to be able to target both mother and child as a unit. 
And conversely, what I believe is that interventions that presume a separation of the mother's interest from the child interest do a disservice to both and, in effect, uh, re replicate the aim of the batterer. One of the reasons batterers sexually abuse their daughters is to isolate them from their mothers. And many of the young women that I have interviewed said that the reason they didn't deal with their sexual abuse, the reason they didn't tell their mothers or tell anybody else about the sexual abuse is because they realized if they did that, they would have to leave the home, their mother would be forced to say something. Uh, for example, uh, in the case that you mentioned earlier, we were talking about the woman in, who shot her husband and who was in prison, um, the daughter, after she was sexually abused by the father, came to the mother and told her that. And her mother uh, had, uh, was very disturbed because she herself had been sexually abused as a child by an uncle, and her mother had refused to believe her. So the girl came to the mother and said to the mother, you know, that uh, the husband, Keith his name was, uh, had, se what was se had sexually touched her. He didn't have uh, sex with her, but he inappropriately touched her. He was coming into her room at night and so forth and so on. And uh, so the mother said, um, tell me what I should do. Should I leave him? Probably inappropriate to leave that decision to the daughter. The daughter said no, and she moved out of the house. Looking back, uh, the mother feels very badly that she didn't believe the daughter. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the daughter feels like she shared that with her mother that somehow uh, the decision was made by both of them, that the mother had given her permission to move out, even though she felt guilty about leaving the mother uh, there. It's very interesting. This daughter, who's now 22, uh, was when, before the mother shot the, the father, a heroin addict. She developed a heroin ha a habit in part because of the stepfather in the house uh, who, he was using heroin. He later used her, even when she was not living in the house, uh, to get him heroin and so forth and so on. The day that she shot her husband, she stopped using heroin, and she hasn't used heroin in the three years since the homicide. Now, that's amazing. 